Waters are fast moving. Unlike other big rallies, the a bit earlier at about 7 a.m., a group from the Coast Guard. Welcome to Hashtag PH Vote 2013. Today on Rapper. Day two of oral arguments before the Supreme Court. The Solicitor General says flaws found by state auditors don't justify scrapping the pork barrel. Jean Napolas faces tax evasion charges. We have to be very firm and uh, inconsistent on in our drive against uh, food loves in uniform. And former President Joseph Estrada celebrates his 100th day as Manila mayor. Hello, I'm Maria Ressa. Welcome to Rappler, your social news network. On day two of oral argument hearings, Solicitor General Francis Hardeleza makes the case there are no flaws in the laws governing the Priority Development Assistance Fund, or PDAF. He argues flaws found by the COA does not justify scrapping the PDAF, but certainly is a reason to push for reforms. The court is handling three petitions questioning whether or not PDAF is legal. Hardeleza makes an emotional appeal to the court on behalf of scholars and the poor who will be deprived of medical assistance, adding they're not party to the corruption. For all the sins committed, abuses committed in the PDAF, the, those who are responsible for it uh, will be and should be punished. But you are talking of more than half a million scholars and more than almost a half a million patients. These people are innocent. So today is the last uh, time, uh, the last opportunity we will have to, to try to convince, to persuade, uh, to beg the Supreme Court. These are innocent uh, parties. They have nothing to do with whatever sins plague the PIDAF uh, uh, you know, scum. Hardeleza offers a different reading of the special provisions in the PDAF laws. The Solicitor General argues there are no realignment of funds, but a definition of the scope of one project to another. He says there is no breach of constitutionality and no violation of separation of powers. Hardeleza also says it is the government's position that previous rulings of the Supreme Court, specifically the Filconza ruling, the Sarmiento ruling, and the Lamp ruling, are still valid and that despite the COA reports, there were no violations. Hardeleza suggests that Filconza is sui generis or a class of its own, allowing for identification of projects after the passing of the General Appropriations Act or GAA. But Hardeleza clashes with Associate Justice Antonio Carpio, who repeats his own arguments from day one. Carpio says previous rulings upholding the legality of the PDAF are not applicable to this current case. Hardeleza also argues that the solution is not a judicial remedy. He says if the court imposes a judicial solution, it prevents the political branches from correcting from within. Hardeleza argues a judicial solution may dwarf the political capacity of the people and deaden their, morals, their sense of moral responsibility. He also claims Congress has responded by abolishing the PDAF. But Carpio counters. It's the court's duty to apply the Constitution. He says, you're asking us to defer our solemn duty. I think you ask too much of this court. Carpio also asks Hardeleza if the president has the power to abolish the PDAF. Hardeleza says the president has the general power to stop releases, but Carpio counters, PDAF can only be abolished in two cases, if Congress passes a law to repeal it or if the court declares it unconstitutional. Justice Teresita de Castro asks if the Constitution isn't violated, noting that in the GAA there are no savings to speak of. During interpolations with the youngest member of the Supreme Court, Justice Marvik Leonen, Hardeleza again reiterates that the court should lift the restraining order on the PDAF, adding that it's an awesome power to wield, Leonen asks in turn. Are we not confronted by a problem that's just as awesome, referring to the pork barrel scam? During Leonin's interpolation, the Solicitor General also says he is not invoking the political question doctrine, which holds that a court should refuse to decide an issue involving, quote, the, separate, the exercise of discretionary power by the executive or legislative. He reiterates the political branches of government are correcting the problem. Leonin retorts that in that case, the government won't mind that the Supreme Court assists in correcting the problem. Chief Justice Maria Lourdes Serena questions the role of legislators in the release and realignment of the pork barrel, saying, quote, you can't make changes without the consent of the proponents. She says, 
Congress was really participating actively in the programming and realignment. It's as if they're part of the planning team of DPWH. With the Supreme Court stopping the release of pork barrel for the rest of 2013, President Benigno Aquino says the government is looking for ways to fund projects originally listed under Lawmakers Priority Development Assistance Fund, or PDAF. Aquino says the court's decision will minimize chances the pork barrel would be misused, but says well-meaning projects are left hanging. Aquino asks Budget Secretary Florencio Abad to find alternative funding without violating the Supreme Court order. The Solicitor General asks the court to lift the temporary restraining order on the PDAF and the Malampaya fund releases. Responding to questions from Senator Ralph Recto on the billions of pesos supposedly missing from the Malampaya fund, the Bureau of Treasury says 137.29 billion pesos worth of royalties is intact. In a statement, Treasurer Rosalia de Leon says, Senator Recto's claims are unfounded and misleading. The remaining Malampaya fund balance, all amounting to 137.288 billion pesos, are not gone, as he says, but perfectly intact in the national treasury. The Bureau says the fund is stored under a special account in the general fund called Fund Code 151. Recto earlier said the last time he asked the Budget Department about the funds, he was told, quote, there is no 130 billion pesos in cash. The fund comes from the Malampaya Natural Gas Project that's been operating off the shores of Palawan for 13 years. It is the single biggest investment in the Philippines with proceeds amounting to 170 billion pesos over the years. The Bureau of Internal Revenue files tax evasion charges against Jean Napolis, the daughter of alleged pork barrel scam mastermind Janet Napolis. BIR Commissioner Kim Linares says Jean Napolis has tax liabilities of 32 million pesos based on her confirmed ownership of two properties, one in Los Angeles, California worth 54.73 million pesos and another in Pangasinan worth 1.49 million pesos. Enares says Jean failed to file any income tax return for 2011 to 2012 that would prove she derived income to be able to buy these properties. Jean owns a condominium unit at the posh Ritz-Carlton in Los Angeles. On October 5, it was put up for sale. The Justice Department will ask the United States government to issue a freeze order on the condo and other Nepalis-owned U.S. properties saying, quote, these are proceeds of the crime of large-scale corruption. The Department of Environment and Natural Resources, or DENR, says the amount it spent on meals is reasonable and properly justified. State auditors found the agency spent about 3,000% more than its 2012 budget for meals. The Commission on Audit report shows the Office of the Secretary had a food and catering budget of 704,000 pesos last year, but spent 22.09 million pesos. DENR Assistant Secretary for Administrative and Finance, Corazon Davis, justifies the expenses, saying the department hosted many conferences and activities last year, including the International Global Conference on Land-Based Ocean Connection in January 2012. That was attended by over 500 local and foreign participants from 90 countries. Davis says the department's hosting paved the way for the Philippines being named the host of the 2015 APEC meeting on global management of oceans. Celebrating his first 100 days as mayor of Manila, Joseph Estrada hopes to win back tourists from Hong Kong after the controversial handling of the 2010 hostage crisis surfaces again in the APEC summit. Maya Kupin reports. It was an issue that hounded President Aquino in the APEC summit and got three Hong Kong journalists thrown out. It's the three-year-old bungled hostage-taking incident at the Quirino Grandstand. Former President and now Manila Mayor Joseph Estrada says he wants to bring back Hong Kong tourists to the Philippine capital. Maybe next month, uh, I'm going to Beijing first, then going back home, uh, passed by Hong Kong, and talk to the officials there. Because they have a travel ban for tourists. Eight Hong Kong tourists died on August 23, 2010, during the 10-hour hostage-taking by a SAF police officer. Estrada, in an interview with Hong Kong Media, apologized for the incident. Well, uh, in the first place, they only want uh, the mayor to apologize. So, uh, even if I'm not the mayor then, I will apologize for, uh, for the, in behalf of the people of Manila, for the unfortunate incident that happened. And I will bow to them that it will never happen under my watch. Or under my administration. China urges the Philippine government to address the concerns of the hostage victims and their families. 
But President Aquino refuses to issue an official apology, saying it's the fault of one gunman and not the entire nation. Several victims sued the Philippines over the incident, but a Hong Kong court said they could not sue a sovereign state. But they can still press charges against eight Philippine government officials, including former Manila Mayor Alfredo Lim and incumbent Vice Mayor Isko Moreno. Out of, out of those many who were uh, found uh, uh, having negligence or liabilities under the IRC investigation, and after the review, I'm the only person. Uh, ako lang yung tinanggal na walang liability. Because pictures and videos speak a thousand words and it speaks for itself. Peace and order issues are just some of the problems of the city of Manila. On Thursday, Estrada Delivers has reported the city on his administration's first 100 days. He says he is focused on bringing back Manila's glory days. Estrada and Moreno introduced several dramatic and controversial changes in the city. There's a ban on buses without terminals, street hawkers driven out of Divisoria, an all-out war against illegal gambling, and the flushing out of Manila's worst, the now iconic corrupt cop. We'll be very firm and uh, inconsistent on our drive against uh, hoodlums and uniforms, against cotton cops. Tough-talking Estrada dreams big dreams for Manila, but he admits changing the image of a city now known as the Gates of Hell will be a tougher act. Bea Kupin, Rappler, Manila. Tropical storm Santi, international name Nari, accelerates Thursday afternoon, moving west towards central and northern Luzon. State Weather Bureau Pagasa says Santi is located 490 kilometers east of Baler, Aurora. Storm signal number one is up over the provinces of Catanduanes, Camarines Sur, Camarines Norte, Quezon, Aurora, and Isabela. It's expected to make landfall in Aurora and Isabela by the weekend. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry postpones his visit to the Philippines on Friday because of a tropical storm. The Philippine uh, Foreign Affairs Department says Washington Kerry postponed the visit after he was officially advised by the U.S. Air Force. DFA spokesman Raul Hernandez adds Kerry committed to visit Manila before the year ends. The Philippines says it expects tropical storm Santi, international name Nari, to make landfall Saturday. Kerry was set to stand in for U.S. President Barack Obama, who pulled out of planned trips in Asia because of the U.S. government shutdown. President Aquino earlier said items on Kerry's agenda include the framework agreement on boosting U.S. troops' presence in the Philippines and U.S. intentions in Syria, with about 3,000 Filipinos remaining in the war-torn country. Kerry's planned visit is seen as a show of U.S. support for the Philippines. The Philippines accuses China of increasingly aggressive behavior in the South China Sea dispute. A forum organized by the United Nations asks three leading women how they push for integrity and governance and lead meaningful lives at the same time. Angela Kasawai reports. They deal with the pork barrel scam head on. They audit the misuse of public funds, hold politicians accountable, and prosecute the corrupt. Ombudsman Conchita Carpio Morales, Commission on Audit Chairperson Grace Polido Tan, and Social Watch Convener Leonor Briones give us a glimpse of the women behind the position of leadership. In a rare opportunity, Ombudsman Morales provides a glimpse into her private life. You all look at me as a tiger in public. I can be as coy as a kitten in the house. Wow! Because I am a Gemini, and you know what a Gemini stands for. Chair Tan, who is married to lawyer Bayani Tan, says she wanted to retire at age 40 to give more time to her five kids. And my husband said, will you please really, really think about what you're talking about? Because their husbands at that time were already asking them to stop, to stay home because the kids were growing and, and you know, uh, they needed personal attention. But my husband was very tired. No, you don't need to. You're, you're doing well. I mean, the kids are doing fine. So he is like that, and I think that, uh, that that helps a lot, especially in a job like mine. Professor Briones used to head the National Treasury. She and her husband traced their roots to the People's Movement. In the progressive movement, education, class, let's not take it into consideration at all. And so it was only after our marriage that he discovered that, that what I am. And so my son was asking, what kind of a mama are you? I've never seen you doing any of this thing. 
and I said, I have a super mama. <laughs> What's the secret to keeping focused despite intense pressure? I think uh, the secret of many women who are fearless, who do things, it's because their men, their husbands, partners, and their children believe in them in the first place, and their macho pride is not affected. <laughs> As the nation cries out for reforms, these three women are at the forefront of the fight against corruption. They're also at the forefront of breaking the glass ceiling. Angela Kasawai, Rappler. Well, let's now look at Rappler's Rap for today, a list of the 10 most important events around the world you shouldn't miss. At number three, Libyan Prime Minister Ali Zaydan is released several hours after armed men seized him from a Tripoli hotel. The abduction appears to be in retaliation for a U.S. raid over the weekend when a senior al-Qaeda suspect was seized. Two groups of former rebels are suspected of being behind the prime minister's kidnapping. At number four, following a crackdown against protesters in the Muslim Brotherhood, the United States suspends deliveries of major military hardware and cash assistance to Egypt. In a statement, the U.S. State Department says the suspension of assistance would remain, quote, pending credible progress toward an inclusive, democratically elected civilian government through fair and free elections. In August, a crackdown by authorities on the supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi left hundreds of people dead. At number six, astronomers find a gaseous exoplanet formed 12 million years ago. The planet was found floating alone in space outside the solar system, 80 light years from Earth. It has a mass six times that of Jupiter and is without a host star. And at number eight, four planets, Jupiter, Neptune, Saturn, and Uranus, may be hosting sparkling diamonds too. Researchers say these planets have the perfect temperature and pressure conditions to host carbon in the form of diamonds. The interiors of the four planets have very hot pressurized gas. The cores of Jupiter and Saturn would melt diamond, while the centers of Uranus and Neptune are cold enough to keep it solid. For the full top 10, visit Rappler.com's The Wrap. Megan Young is back in the Philippines after winning this country's first Miss World crown. The 23-year-old actress flies in from France Thursday evening. Megan is joined by Miss World Organization President Julia Morley. From the airport, Megan proceeds to the Solaire Resort and Casino for her homecoming press conference and a victory dinner. On Friday, a victory parade to celebrate her win will take place from Makati to Pasay starting at 2 p.m. The first preseason NBA game in the Philippines between the Houston Rockets and the Indiana Pacers is underway. The two teams arrived in the Philippines Monday and participated in several NBA CARES activities for local kids. Leading the way for the Rockets are three-time NBA Defensive Player of the Year Dwight Howard, scorer James Harden, and the man responsible for Lynn's sanity, point guard Jeremy Lin. The Pacers are led by rising star Paul George, all-star center Roy Hibbert, and forward Danny Granger. Every story on Rappler has a mood meter, which gives you eight emotions to choose from. Click how you feel and your vote comes down to the mood navigator in the middle of the front page. That crowdsources the mood of the day. It also gives you the top 10 stories that have affected Rappler's readers and viewers the most emotionally. Those 10 stories are here on the front page. These are the 10 stories that have gotten the most number of votes on their mood meter. If we take a look today, um, today's story, top one of our top stories, Gina Polis charged with tax evasion. You have 2% angry, 2% annoyed, 7% amused, and a whopping 89% happy. Um, on the ongoing PDAF, Justice Carpio says PDAF and Malampaya fund illegal. Again, interestingly, 19% inspired and a whopping 60% happy. That green, the mood of the day, today, most people are happy. Well, that's good. That is Rappler's newscast for today, Thursday, October 10th, 2013. Visit Rappler.com and watch our newscast Monday to Friday. Tell us how you feel on our mood meter and help us crowdsource the mood of the day. I'm Maria Ressa. As we say at Rappler, tomorrow begins today.